2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Brother Paul gave me a, a verse song. We've got to learn this song. I like this. It, it's a number, hymn number 466. I'm not going to teach it to you now, so don't go turn in there. But it's entitled, Win Them One by One. That's a good theme song for um, our, our program, um, One by One. I like that. The chorus goes, So you bring the one next to you, and I'll bring the one next to me, and all kinds of weather. We'll all work together and see what can be done. If you'll bring the one next to you, and I'll bring the one next to me in time, uh, no, no time at all. We'll have them all. So win them, win them one by one. How about that? That's a good verse, number four sixty-six. We'll have to jump into that and sing it occasionally as we, as we recognize somebody that's um, gotten into uh, church. Now, so we're going to pick up this number three lesson here tonight on um, uh, have a new kid. Uh, it's really a message to parents. It's not really a message to trying to uh, straighten the kids out. It's trying to straighten the parents out. Amen. Y'all encourage me, and, I'll, and I won't be as mean on you. But uh, so we we skipped last week. Um, we had a great service last week, Brother Webb preaching and uh, the baptism and all that. And uh, we're back into lesson number three. The first lesson we talked about uh, th that with the reason for behavior, the reason for behavior. Um, a lot of times the reason children uh, exhibit bad behavior is because they're, they're wanting attention. Um, we need to realize that children inherently want attention. Um, and we need to do that in a proper means, to give them the attention for behaving well, not behaving poorly. And um, they, 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 behave, they behave badly, if you will, because they've been trained to behave badly. You know, you just have to, you have to bite the bullet on that and realize that we are, we're training our children how to behave. And when we, when we let them misbehave and we let them have attitudes and let them do wrong, then we train them to, to do that. When we give them what they want after they pitch a fit or, or, or um, uh, don't do right, then we, we let them, um, we train them to do that. And the best teacher uh, is consequences. And so we talked about that in the first week, the reason for behavior. Number two, we said the second week, parenting is a balancing act. And so we gave another key concept, which is a balancing of nurture and admonition. Nurture and admonition. The balancing of the building of the relationship with your children and that of the authority structure with your children. It's important for us to have the proper balance. It's like a building. The taller you want it to be, the deeper the foundation has to be. And so the more authority you want, the more relationship you have to have. And conversely, the more relationship you want, the more authority you need. You say, oh, I don't believe that I can have a relationship without authority. You can for a little while, but as time progresses, as the children get older, they will so disrespect you because you have no authority that it will deteriorate the relationship. They will be disrespectful. They'll be, um, uh, they'll be disgusted with you. Uh, there, there has to be a problem. Anything, and listen, if, if the nurture and the admonition gets out of balance, it's devastating. So now we move to the third lesson, and we'll talk tonight about children need self-worth. And I'm going to take just a moment and kind of pause this and say, I didn't say this earlier, didn't spot uh, Tiffany and Jaden and uh, um, Shannon and Amy and their grand grandson. Uh, congratulations. Good to see you all tonight. And uh, we're happy for you. Amen. Glad to see you all doing well and in church so quickly. That's a blessing. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to read from uh, the book of Job, if I can, and uh, chapter number 17. Um, and I... Uh, I think I can find Job chapter 17. And just, uh, I usually mark these verses, and for some reason I didn't do that tonight. And so y'all bear with me. It's Job 17 and verse number 5. The Bible says, He that speaketh flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children shall fail. Um, and, it, and basically what it's talking about here is, is um, the word flattery is talking about praising somebody insincerely. Okay, saying something good about, or, or saying something nice to somebody that doesn't really reflect who they are or what's true or for an ulterior motive. And uh, we'll, you're going to understand what we're going to talk about tonight. It's the difference between self-worth and self-esteem. And so he says, even, you know, if you do it to your friends, it's not good. Um, but even if, if you try to do it with your children, it affects him. The eyes of his children shall fail. In other words, uh, even your, your children are affected by flattery or false praise. Okay, so it's important that we, we're going to have to identify the, difference, the distinction between self-worth and self-esteem. In Proverbs chapter 13, well, I'll just turn just a little bit ahead here to the book of Proverbs. 
hand up, read to you from chapter 13 and verse 15. And you can go if you want to. You should say reaction. I'm working my way to 2 Timothy. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 15. We see another great truth reiterated. It says, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Now, that means if, if, we, don't, um, <clears throat> if we don't provide our children um, with a, a proper understanding of what develops self-worth or, or, you know, understanding of what is the right way, then it, it leaves them with a hard way. It leaves them with a difficult life. And that's why I'm, what I'm sharing with you now is so vitally important because when we begin to deal in this matter of self-esteem, and by the way, self-esteem is the rage. It's what everybody talks about. Children need self-esteem. And uh, the Bible uses the word esteem quite often, but it's a different word than what is used in this modern vernacular for the word esteem. And uh, here the proverb teaches us that it makes, uh, without a proper understanding, the way is hard for the transgressor. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 21, the Bible teaches us, An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. And I want to apply that to parenting. An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning. In other words, uh, you know, it may seem wonderful early on to just praise your children in ways that don't reflect self-worth. It may seem wonderful early on uh, to uh, go this to this esteem game, if you will, or to go down the road of, of um, not helping them develop. It takes, it takes effort to train a child. And it may seem early on that you're just, it's just wonderful, but later on it won't seem so great. And it'll cause a lot of grief. It makes the way hard um, for the transgressor. And, and, and you'll understand when I say transgressor as I begin to teach the lesson. And then finally in 2 Timothy, and we'll look at chapter 2, where you probably already are. And um, I'll read to, from chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. <clears throat> the Bible said, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house. All right, now, I can apply this to church. I can also apply this to the family unit. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth. And some to honor and some to dishonor. So you can, you can create the association here. The gold and silver are vessels of honor. The, the wood and earth represent the vessels of dishonor. Okay, and he goes, if, if a man therefore purge himself from these, that word these goes all the way back to verse 19 where it's talking about departing from iniquity. Uh, iniquity is that doing things the way we want to do it, not the way God wants us to do it. Iniquity can be sin. Um, him to know what to do good and do it not, it's sin. But iniquity can just simply be doing it. The Bible says there's a way that's right unto man, that seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Iniquity leads to sin because ultimately it's doing it our way instead of God's way. And so if a man therefore purge himself from iniquity, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart. That's what sanctified, set apart. In other words, able to be used by God and meet or fit for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust. Okay, the desires of young people. Children have inherent lustful desires. They want attention and they, they'll get it. If you don't give it to them in the right way, they'll, do, they'll misbehave to get it. Children want what they want. It's inherently in us. We all have that fleshly, childish nature that wants to have our way. And he says, flee these lusts. Follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and them that call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. So I'm going to try to apply these things tonight and give you a biblical foundation. And I've got about five uh, statements uh, that I want to make. And, um, and some of them have a few sub points after them. So follow with me carefully. And I'll try to do this as concisely as I possibly can. Number one, now th and everyone cling to these things I say. And here again, I, I'm going to, at the end of the series, I will give you this in, in written format and a little booklet that you can keep. And so you don't have to sit here and just wear your little fingers off trying to take notes. But, um, but, but do cling to what I'm saying. Number one, and, and I don't know which one of these statements is the most important, but it, but it starts right out here in, in, in a very important way. Self-worth is based on obedience. Self-worth is based upon us being obedient. Doing right, if you will. Okay? Uh, Self-worth in an individual 
is, a, is something that, that God gives us. You know, the, our Constitution said that we, we said every man is, you know, was created with, uh, endowed with the Creator by unalienable rights. In other words, the, our Constitution was acknowledging the fact that God made us inherently with some virtues, with some value, if you will, uh, and certain rights that go along with that. You know, real value comes from God. And where we get our, our worth, and that, that word worth is, is talking about, um, you know, uh, it's talking about this sense of, of, um, of value in ourselves, not esteem, but value. It comes from obedience. Now, in these verses we just read, you know, I said iniquity is, is doing what you feel like doing instead of what, doing what's right. Iniquity is just doing like you feel like doing instead of, you know, there's a way that seemeth right in the man. Uh, in, in the, in the, the kings, one of the problems was in first and second kings is the people did that which was right in their own eyes. And, and that, is, that is a great problem in our society that we tend to do what we feel like doing, not what is right. Now, <clears throat> The Bible says we're to purge ourselves from behaving like this. And if we're to do that in, to, in, to ourselves, we're certainly to help train our children up in that way. We should purge out this desire, this youthful lust to do what they feel like doing instead of doing right. Are you with me? We should purge out this desire to let them go to the basis of behavior that says, I do what I feel like doing. I get up when I feel like getting up. I eat what I feel like eating. I watch what I feel like watching. I listen to what I feel like listening to. I do what I want to do. I'm a person driven by iniquity. Instead of doing that, which is right. Well, whole churches have given over this concept. They've just said, well, why don't we give the people what they want instead of what's right? Okay. And God says we're to purge ourselves from this kind of thinking. We're to purge ourselves from this, this, this kind of behavior. Why? Because we're to be vessels of honor. Now, if you'll study that word honor out, and I did this years ago, there are several words that, that have a uh, almost synonymous meaning. And honor and um, uh, esteem, when it's used in the Bible sense, has a lot to do with this matter, uh, the Greek word of timeo and uh, um uh, doxa, and, and these Greek words that are, they, they come very closely together. And what they mean is, it really carries the, the, the significance of something weighty, as of a heavy metal like gold, something precious, something that carries a lot of value. And God says uh, that you'll be a vessel unto value. You'll be worth something for the kingdom of God. Now, you with me there? You'll be, the, the Bible says that you'll be a vessel unto honor, which means is a vessel that is valuable. Valuable to what? Valuable to the kingdom of God. Does it mean that God doesn't value you as a person if you're only because of what you do? God loved us enough that he died for us even while we're yet sinners. So he values us for who we are. But what he's saying here is that you'll be worth something to my kingdom purpose. And by the way, not training your children properly in the early years makes them almost worthless to the kingdom of God. Not to mean that God doesn't love them, doesn't mean He doesn't want them to go to heaven, but it means when it comes to place, you know, we have a dearth in our world today of anybody that really wants to serve God much. We're finding that it's harder to find people called to the mission field, harder to find preachers that are willing to go into the ministry. Um, people are, they don't have the self discipline. Uh, if you knew the statistics of the numbers of, listen, you take good men that are, that are give themselves to go to missions, and you actually see how many of them actually get to the mission field, it's staggeringly low. Why is that? Because a lot of reasons is they haven't been trained to be obedient and do which is right rather than doing what they feel like doing. A lot of the times the reason pastors have such a hard time is because when you get to the place where I'm at, listen, other than Debbie, nobody tells me what to do. But I, I let her because I love her. But no, the really is if I don't get myself up in the morning, who's going to get me up? If I don't make myself go do something, who's going to make me do it? And the problem is that if you don't train somebody to have some, some discipline to do what's right, ultimately we become useless for the kingdom of God. And God, that's what he's talking about. You'll purge yourself from iniquity, doing what you feel like doing, then you'll, you'll be a vessel unto honor, valuable to the kingdom of God. And so he says, flee lust, and so in other words, do what's right. Do what's right. He says, follow righteousness. We think of righteousness in the terms of being saved. But more often than not, when the Bible speaks of righteousness, it's in the context of doing rightly. 
We're not saved by doing rightly. We have inherited the righteousness of Christ. But now that we're saved, God expects us to live rightly, to do right. Boy, old Bob Jones used to preach that message. Do right. If the stars fall, do right. Amen? And I'm just saying, self-worth is based on obedience. <clears throat> when a person is trained to do right, instead of what they feel like doing, they develop real self-worth. Real self-worth. I'll show you more about that. Okay? Now, let's go to the second statement. Self-worth is very different than modern self-esteem. You see, worth... Our value is the byproduct of labor. Okay? In other words, if you work, then you have produced a product, whether it may be the labor you produce or something you made or built or whatever. When, when work is done, it generally, if it's done well, it produces a product that has a value to it. You know, maybe something, you may not have to be digging a ditch. It could be digging a ditch or it could be um, tapping on a keyboard. But something you've done to produce something is your labor produces a byproduct uh, which is worth something. Esteem, though, as the world sees it, is, uh, is a product of feelings. I feel good about myself. Feeling good and self-worth are two vitally different concepts. And, and they're so different, and yet, if we're not careful, we buy into this idea that we're supposed to make our children feel good about themselves. Now, the problem is, you cannot produce feel good. Feelings are a byproduct as well, as self-worth is. Worth is a byproduct of labor. And feelings are likewise a byproduct of, of doing the right things too. Now, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, you don't have to turn there, but, and I don't read the whole verse, but it basically tells us that we're to esteem others. In other words, we're to value others more than we're to value ourselves. And yet, even in the, even that's, the, that's not even using the concept of, of esteem as the world uses it today. It's vitally important that we understand that we, we have to resist this idea that we're to make our children feel good about themselves, be happy all the time, and to gratify their every want and desire. And yet we're compelled to do that. I mean, uh, and part of it is the marketing strategy of advertisers. They're, they're trying to make you think that if you don't get your children the latest toy, gimmick, gadget, whatever, that, um, uh, that they're going to be unhappy. And you're a bad parent if you have unhappy children. That's not true. That's not true at all. Matter of fact, it's, it's, uh, it's a lie from the pits of hell. You know, um, <clears throat> I remember years ago, Dave and I were, we had been married long, and we were out somewhere, and I can't remember, where, we were at a parking lot, I think, over in Cobb County, and, and somebody came up and said they had uh, had a good deal. They, they were in a hard time. They wanted to sell us a ring. You remember that? And um, we bought that ring in the parking lot. And, boy, we felt good about ourselves. Man, we thought we got a deal on a one. And we took that ring down to the jeweler. <clears throat> Turn me on right here, if you will. And I'll just use this one, Brother Dennis. I don't know why this is cutting out, but just, just let me have this one, okay? And so we found out that um, we, didn't have, uh, we didn't have anything in that. We had more in that thing than it was worth. We thought we got a good deal, and we got snookered, okay? Uh, but, but what I had done, though, is I had worked hard to save some money, and I bought her a, a, a ring not too long after that. Um, just, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a ring or a necklace, but it was really worth something. I, I mean, it was, it was real gold, real diamond, and, and um, it was valuable. And to this day, the jewel that I bought her that was real is still worth something. If somebody didn't steal it from us. But, um, you know, uh, it's worth something. But that ring that I bought, was it, was, it, was, it, was, um, it felt good at the time because we got something cheaply. We thought we got a good deal. We thought we got more than what we... Listen, I had little invested in it when I come to find out that it was worth less than I even put into it. And that's the way esteem is versus real genuine self-worth. When you, when you try to make your kids feel good about themselves by, by flattery, if you will, or by, uh, by uh, trying to give them things to keep them happy then you're creating in them a false sense of euphoria that but lasts very shortly. It's kind of like these energy drinks. You know, I mean, it, it'll pump you up for a little while, but then you're going to crash, and then, you, then you're, going to, you're going to mess up your metabolism, and you're going to get in these where you have to have more. of It's like drugs. A little bit at the beginning makes you feel good about it. Then you have to have a little bit more, a little bit more, and pretty soon you're addicted to the drug, and you're not happy even when you're on the stuff. Right. Um, that is what... This feel-goodism does to young people. 
It creates this uh, false sense of euphoria because they've got what they want, but then they need more, and they need more, and they need more. And that's how when you see kids get older and they're constantly needing more things to make them happy. And truth of the matter is that's why a lot of marriages fail because by the time they get to be married, you know, they, they've already indulged themselves in fornication to make themselves happy. And now the marriage is not what they thought it was going to be because they never really understood that, that marriage takes work. And when you work at it, you have a good relationship, then, then it's worth something. But a marriage that's just built on a feel-good moment is not, has any, it doesn't have any value to it. And so parents spend way too much time trying to make their children happy, and we're raising feel-good children, and we're doing that by giving them all the things they want. Now, make a third statement here. And all these are vitally important. Feelings follow behavior. And what I mean by that, it's like, it's like the, now when I got saved, a person used a little track and it, and it talked about the difference between faith and feelings. And uh, I said, well, I don't know if I, I, I want to be saved, but I, I don't know if I'm going to feel like being a Christian tomorrow. And they, they gave me the illustration that said, well, we're not saved by feelings, we're saved by faith. And they, they put the, the little train car out there and they said, this is faith, the engine represents faith, and feelings are the caboose, and they just follow faith, you know. And we can't live by feelings, we live by faith. And it made that illustration. But the truth of the matter is that more than we realize, feelings follow behavior. You know, in John chapter 13 and verse 17, Jesus made this statement. He said, if you know these things, what he was teaching them, Happy are ye if you do them. Okay? He said, you're going to be happy. And, and I'll tell you what that word happy means here in just a, just a minute. Happy if you not just know them, but if you do them. Faith, I'm, I'm sorry, feelings follows the behavior. If you behave properly, it produces a good feeling within you. If you behave poorly, you sin or do wrong, it creates a guilt within you. And guilt is not a function of your mental problem. Uh, our world will try to teach us, and psychiatry will try to teach us that, that, that guilt is just a, uh, a, a, is a, is a product of our culture, our environment. You know, um, they, they would say, well, the problem is you were raised in too strict a home, or you're, you had too strict a church, and you're, you grew up under some Bible thumper. Now you feel guilty about everything. No, the truth is, Guilt is universal. That's why you can go to regions that have never heard the name of Jesus, never seen a Bible, and you'll find the people guilty offering sacrifices to some unknown God because they know in their heart there's something wrong. They, they've broken God's law, and they feel guilty about it. Guilt is a universal concept based on sin, and that's why through every generation of history of mankind, as far as anthropology has, can study backward and across all cultural boundaries and every continent on, that, that people have, um, where people have existed over the course of the last 6,000 years, you'll find find a concept of the guilt uh, uh, that, that function in people's lives, and it's because they've sinned against God, the God they don't even know, the Bible they don't even heard of. They've done wrong, and they feel guilty about it, and so they begin offering a sacrifice. Why is that? Because guilt is non-optional function of disobedience and breaking of God's law. And you can't just get rid of guilt by denying it. It can only be cleared by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so James 5.11 says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. And that word endure means that don't quit, don't give up. And, and this word, both these words happy come from a Greek word, makarios, makarios which basically it means, it means blessed. Or literally, if you take that to its Greek root, it says well off. Okay? Or um, well blessed or having an inheritance or, or having substance or having the things that you need or, or having food and shelter. It, it goes to the root of saying that if you do these things, you're well off. You're val you have value in your life. If you endure and don't quit when times get tough, then you have produced a value in your life. You're blessed. You're well off. And what this is saying is that if we will keep on doing right, in due season we shall reap if we think not. If we keep on doing right, then it's going to produce that sense of blessedness in our life. If we do the things that Jesus teaches us, then it's going to produce that sense of blessedness in our life. Blessedness is an enduring quality. It's not something that's fleeting. It's the fruit of obedience. Happiness is based on feelings and desires. I feel like I ought to do this, and if I do it, I'll, I'll be happy. But it doesn't last very long. 
Matter of fact, it only lasts as long as the guilt that slaps you in the back of the head and tells you, man, you feel horrible because you knew you did wrong. And you may become dull to that sense of guilt, but it just leads you to have to have greater sins to, to, to make you feel good or greater pleasures to make you feel good. That's why we're such a, uh, an, an extreme society. You notice that? I mean, imagine when I was a kid, we used to ride motorcycles and we'd build a little ramp out there in the yard and we'd jump about five or ten feet and well, we were thrilled to death. Now they're jumping 60 feet and flipping and doing dados and letting go of the things and, and just seeing if they can kill themselves. You know, they got to jump off everything, fly off everything, do everything that's crazy. They got, you know, when we were a kid, I had a skateboard. We had a driveway that was long and sloped and we'd get on that skateboard and we'd ride down that driveway. We never thought about trying to get it on a ramp and jump 50 feet in the air and just to see if we could, how many bones we could break on the way down. Why? We're an extreme society, and it takes more to make us feel good than it used to. You know why? Because we don't understand the concept of self-worth versus self-esteem. And when you train children that, they, that they're to feel good about themselves, then they have to keep doing more things to make them feel good because what they did last doesn't feel good anymore. You're with me? I feel like I'm, I'm boring you. Now, Guilt is the fruit of disobedience. When we obey, the fruit that we have is blessedness, a sense of feeling good about ourselves because we have done something worthwhile and valuable. Happiness, in the world's vernacular, is, uh, uh, is uh, the product of, of feeling good about um, having our desires met, and it's fleeting. It doesn't last very long. And guilt is the product of being disobedient. So I'll make the fourth statement, and I'm moving right to a conclusion here in just a couple of statements, and then we'll, we'll wrap this thing up. Watch what happens now. When children aren't trained to obey. Now, remember my first statement said that um, self-worth is the product of obedience. Now, I mean, I can't, I can't um, you know, um, express this any greater than what I'm trying to say. I wish I could. But when we train children to obey, we train them to do right. And when they do right, they know that they've, they become pleasing to God and that they're valuable to the kingdom of God. They're a vessel unto honor and they have some worth about themselves. But when children aren't trained to obey, watch what happens in this cycle. First thing is they feel bad out of guilt. All right? They haven't done right. They didn't do their chores. They didn't do their homework. They didn't, they didn't obey their parents. They didn't treat their brother or sister right. They didn't do right and they feel guilty about it. So they're, 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 just, they're down in the dumps. They're, you, they're, they're, not, they're not happy. Okay, and so the parent says, I don't want my child to be unhappy. Um, and the child has the desire to feel good about themselves, but they don't realize that the, what they want is a sense of worth that comes from obedience. And so they haven't been trained to obey, so they feel bad. I'm telling you right now, I've seen way too many children that, that constantly have this just a, a bad feeling about themselves. They feel, you know, um, and you know how it is in your life. When you're not right with God, it creates this sense of, uh, of guilt that really produces a cloud that hangs over your life, right? And children are the same way. And when we don't train them to obey, we don't give them the tools to have the self-worth in their life. Um, and so the parents say, I want my child to feel good, so how can I make my child feel good? Why don't we go down here to Toys R Us and buy you something? Or why don't I go get you an ice cream? Or, or I'll tell you what, why don't I go down here and tell the teacher that it wasn't your fault that you didn't do your homework and I'll try to get some extra time for you? Or why don't I actually fuss the teacher out because it was unreasonable to make you do that homework anyway? Okay, and on and on it goes. So the parent tries to give them things to please them. Uh, you know, you say amen right there so that nobody will think we're talking about you. All right. Uh, but if we're not careful, we fall into this trap. We want our children to feel good. They don't feel good because they haven't been doing well, and they, they feel this guilt of sin. And so what we do is we want to give them something to make them feel good because we can't stand for our children to feel bad about themselves. Now, I don't mean to be judgmental, but that's the natural desire of a parent to want their children to be happy. Okay? And so we give them something. Well, the good feelings come, but it only lasts a little while. And then more things are required to create this happiness. And so they want more. They need something else. They need another treat, an, another um, video game, another something else that will make them feel happy. And, and, and as time progresses, they, they disobey more, which creates even more guilt and more bad feelings. And we get in this vicious cycle where, the, where we're giving the child more. The older they get, 
they, they, they got this insatiable need for more things to make them happy. And at the same time, we're, they're being less and less obedient, less and less disciplined in their life, doing more of the things they feel like doing and the things they should do. And so inside of them, they're getting, they have less self-worth and we're trying to pump more feel good into them. And as they get older, they are very unhappy young people. Have you seen what I'm talking about? Am I, is that not true? It is true. It's, all, it's true across society. I mean, it's, it's amazingly true. Now, what happens on the other hand when children are trained to obey? First of all, when you start your children out early, teaching them the right things to do and, and disciplining them to do it. You know, when I started playing baseball, I didn't want to throw a baseball right. I had to have a coach teach me to throw it right and correct me. I didn't want to hit the ball right. I had to have a coach teach me to hit the ball right. When I started playing football, when I started in band, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't blow across that reed just right on that saxophone, and I didn't play the, the, the piano just like I should. I had to have a teacher that said, no, you did that wrong, and you're not holding your hands right. Sit up straight at that bench and hold that thing right. And, and they, they were coaching me. To do right. Why? Because if I ever wanted to be good at baseball or football or at music or anything, I had to learn to do it right. Okay, so when, when we train children to obey, they start doing things well, obediently, doing the right things. You know what? When you teach your children to speak to you properly, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, when you teach your children to respond to you, they feel better about themselves. All right, so why? Why do that? Because they're obeying and they have little guilt. Children shouldn't have to grow up guilt-ridden for the things. When you let your children watch stuff they shouldn't watch on TV, there's a, they're breaking a commandment. They're breaking the laws of God, and they cannot help but feel dirty about themselves. And they feel bad about that. Right, when you train them to obey, to do right then they have little guilt. And what guilt they do have over disobedience can easily be removed because when you have corrected them and they have confessed their sin and you've shown them how to correct it, well, then they get freed from the guilt. Now, as they get older, they, go, they confess their, their sin to God and, and trust the blood of Jesus Christ as, his, as a payment for that, and they make things right with God. In their younger days, truthfully, I don't have, teach, I don't have time to teach you all this, but in, in the younger days of your children, Jesus is their, their best friend, and a parent is more like their God. I know that sounds harsh, but it's true because you don't, here, let me give you an illustration. You know, you tell your child um, uh, that you want them to do their homework, and they say, I don't feel led to do my homework tonight. God's told me I should do it tomorrow night. No, you expect your children to obey you, right? Why? Because God has put you as their authority. One day you're going to pass the mantle. One day the changing the guard is going to take place, and you're going to hand them over, and they're going to be uh, directly under the accountability of their creator, their savior, and you're going to be their best friend. But in those early days, all the way up <laughs> till they leave your home to a certain extent, you, well, as they get older, teenagers, we start handing the, we start the change of the guard. But certainly in the younger formative years, they obey you. And when you, when they correct matters with you, it's, it clears them just as if they cleared it with God. I'm not saying for salvation. I'm saying for the removal of the guilt of the, of the sin, the wrong they've done. I'm teaching you a lot right now, and I'm not trying to overwhelm you with it, but it, it's so important you grasp this concept. So, when children are trained to obey, to do right, they have little guilt, and proper discipline removes the little guilt they have. Number two, they feel good about their behavior. They feel good because they've done right. I don't know if you've ever watched children that feel good about themselves because they've been a, a good boy, a good girl. You know, and truthfully, we praise children a lot for the wrong things. We say, oh, you're, you're so pretty. Well, does that mean if I'm not pretty one day that I'm not going to be valuable anymore? Or, you know, or you're so smart. I mean, I, I, no. How about this? How about praising children for you worked hard to get that paper done, that homework done. You worked hard to get your room cleaned up. You really did a good job of grooming yourself today. I like the way you, the, I like the choice of the clothes you're wearing because you made a good choice. You've chosen to wear something modest. You've chosen to wear something that uh, is, uh, is pleasing to the Lord. See, what we're doing here is we're, we're praising good behavior and what that does is it gives him this sense that I am worthwhile because I've done well. All right, number three, when children are trained to obey and do right, they don't need things to make them happy. 
I'm a, you know what? I've watched children for years, and I can tell you the most contented children are not the ones who've got five toy boxes running over with toys. They are not the most contented children. Can I get a witness? The most contented children are the ones who are disciplined to do the right things in their daily schedule and feel good about themselves. They don't have to have so many other things to make them feel good because they feel good about themselves, because they know that they're living a life that's worthwhile to God. They are vessels unto honor. They have a value to the kingdom of God. Their obedience is in itself their reward. All right, so number four, they enjoy the blessings of the fruit of their labors. And number five, they become vessels unto honor and they have self-worth. That's what happens when you train children to obey, train them to do right. It's, it's inherent that parents... Find out what's right for children to do. It's never right for children to speak disrespectfully to their parents or other adults. And so if you let your children do that, you're training them to sin, which is a guilt in their soul and which makes them feel bad. And then you don't want them to feel bad, so you're tempted to give them something to make them feel good. And all you're doing is creating a cycle of an unhappy child that doesn't know how to ever gain true self-worth. Okay. Okay. Now, does that make sense? The difference between self-worth and self-esteem. Self-esteem is a feel-good sensation that comes from getting the things that we want that, 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 um, that satisfy our lustful, our, our youthful desires. Youthful lust is what the Bible says. And so when, when we live in an iniquitous way, doing the things we feel like doing, then we have no real sense of self-worth. But when we purge ourselves from the desire to, do, to live our life like we feel like and we are trained to do what's right, then our obedience makes us valuable to the kingdom of God, which means that we have a self-worth about us. I mean, you know, I hate to say this, but you know what the, the welfare system our country does is it creates an unhappy nation. You know, when people work, then they have this sense of, we, you know, we, pride is a bad thing for the most part in the Scripture, but to a certain extent, when we talk of pride, we speak of it in, in a positive sense, and that it, really what we're saying about pride is that we, we have a self-worth. In other words, we feel good that we have actually done something that produced something worthwhile. We produced a labor that produced something valuable. A product was turned out. And so we take pride in the fact that we did a good job or we obeyed and we kept the laws and we, we were, we were, we're a good citizen. We're a good student. We're a contribution to the team. And all these things come about because we have put forth the effort that has built a, a system of self-worth in our life. But when we, when we reward people for doing nothing, now, there's a difference between helping those who can't help themselves. There's a difference between helping those who are, are mentally challenged or helping those who are physically challenged or helping those who have just gone through situations beyond their control and they need society in a loving way to reach out and help them. There's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, that's all through the Scripture. God commanded the children of Israel never to completely harvest all the field. They were to leave gleanings. They were never to harvest the corners. They were to leave handfuls on purpose. Why? Because, but even at that, the people who didn't have a field or down their lot, they, there was stuff left over for them to get, but they had to come pick it up. Okay, why? Because even in the welfare system of the Old Testament, it allowed the person to retain their dignity by doing something worthwhile. So they felt like, I didn't just give it to, give it to me for nothing. Now, but what we do in a welfare system in our country is we produce unhappy. And by the way, you watch it. Look at our nation. The more we give people, the less happy our nation is. The more we give people, the more riotous we become, the more complainers we come, the, better, the worse attitude people have. I mean, it just, it just overtakes our nation. Why? Because what we've done is we're trying to produce a feel-good society. And politicians are doing that just so that they can keep their office. But they all know that the best thing for this nation is to quit giving people what they, what they want, their lustful desires, and make them earn a living. Make them do right. Make them build some self-worth in their life. That's what made America great. What's going to destroy America, the same thing destroyed Rome, is when we turn to living by our desires instead of doing what's right. Now, Having said that, so we know the difference between self-worth. Self-worth is something that is a product of obedience. Self-esteem is a product of getting what we want, having our, 
uh, meeting the desires of our feelings and our lusts and having a feel-good society. Avoid, avoid that feel-goodism. Don't train up narcissistic children. Quit asking your children what they want all the time. Quit asking them that question. What do you want to eat? What do you want to wear? Where do you want to go to church? Where do you want to do? What do you want? Listen, when a child is 8, 9, 10, 11 years, 12 years old, you may, you may give them some choices. You may say, look, here's three things. Pick the one you'd like. But don't always cater to what they want. Don't go to the store and say, you can have anything you want uh, and I'll buy it for you. No, you are in control. And when they choose the right thing, you say, you've done well. And obedience is what we reward. Don't reward the desires of a child. They don't know what they should eat. They don't know what they should wear. They don't know what they should watch. They don't know where they should go. They don't know what time they should get up and go to bed. They're children, for goodness sake. It's up to the parent to, to train them to do right. Train a child to get up in the morning. Train a child to go to bed at night. Train a child to clean themselves. Train a child to do the work they're supposed to. Give them. All right, I'm going to hush because I'm running late on time. All right, it's the self-worth that we're developing in a child. And you're giving them a gift that will be valuable to them the rest of their lives. And if you train up your children to be narcissistic little brats that get what they want every time they pitch a fit, you're ruining their lives. You're ruining their lives. All right, I'm going to give you six. Number, number six is six things, five things. Let me say five things, special instru instructions while developing self-worth. Special instructions for the parents that are trying to develop self-worth in their children. And that'll be it, and we'll be done with the lesson tonight. Number one, all right, here, these are the action items. Number one, give your children opportunities to obey. If we're going to build self-worth, and self-worth comes by obedience, then give your children opportunities to obey. That means give them chores to do. Give them things that they're to do. You know, uh, you know if it's a three-year-old child, that child can pick his or her toys up and put them in the toy box in the evening. And when they do that, what a good young boy you are. And then you recognize what they've done well, and they will have this sense of self-worth. I'm a good boy. Never tell a child he's a good boy for doing wrong or not doing what he should do. Don't flatter your children. Don't brag on them for doing nothing. Now, I'm going to get to some other statements in here, but give your children opportunities to obey. Give them chores. Give them responsibilities. Give them goals. Give them rewards when they've accomplished those goals. All right, number two, recognize your child for obedience and hard work. I've already said that, but listen, I want to say this. Children need approval. They desperately need your parental approval. Now, you can either give them flattery and approve of them when they've done nothing well, or you can give them opportunities to obey, and when they do it, notice it and take notice of that and, and recognize and give them approval for the things they do well. Remember I said children want attention. If we give them attention for doing wrong, and that's the only time we give them attention, then they're compelled to do more wrong because they starve for attention. The same thing for approval. They're starved for approval. And if you'll approve of the good things they do, the, the obedience they show, the work they put forth, don't make the list of ten. Don't give a five-year-old a list of ten things to do. Give a five-year-old a list of two things to do maybe or one thing to do and, and, and recognize that what they do. But don't overwhelm them with too much to do. You know, when Andrew was just a little fella, we would put him in a high chair and put a plate of food before him, and uh, he just wouldn't eat it. I just thought, well, he must be um, something wrong with him, you know. I mean, I, I love to eat, <laughs> you know. And we put good food in front of him, and he wouldn't eat it. And we took, went to the, we were going to Dr. Denmark years ago, and we asked her, I said, Andrew just doesn't want to eat. And she said, well, do you give him a lot of food on the plate? He goes, yeah, well, we, we put a generous help. And she said, put about half as much as you've been giving him on the plate. You're overwhelming him. And said, so just give him less, and he'll eat it, and he may ask for more. And wasn't that true? That's what he did. We put less on the plate. He'd eat everything on the plate. Sometimes he said, I want some more of this, I want some more of that. But when we gave him too much, it was overwhelming to him. Don't give your children such responsibilities that they can't perform them, and they feel guilty because they can't get it all done. Give them incrementally what they can do, and then recognize their obedience. They desperately need your approval. And if you're not willing to approve of them, you have really no right to reprimand them. 
Y'all heard me now. What that goes back to lesson number two, the balance of nurture and admonition, relationship and authority. If you're not going to, uh, the approval is a process of the relationship. And, the, and the, 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 the recognition and the approval, the reprimand is more of the authority. And you, you know what? If we're not going to give recognition, then we, we should be very careful about, I'm not saying don't reprimand wrong. Recognize the good. Children, I've said it three, maybe four times now. Children need your approval, parents. And don't flatter them. Don't tell them that they've done well for nothing. But when they've done well, and when you've given them something they can't accomplish, recognize that and help them to grow to the next level and to do more. All right, number three, value your children regardless of their behavior. Now, this is a kind of a flip side of that coin. I'm saying recognize their behavior, reward their good behavior, reward their obedience, but at the same time, Never associate your child's value with their behavior. Your child is loved. Your child is wanted. Your child is embraced regardless of their behavior. And I can only say this to you. Is it, aren't you glad that God loves us even when we don't obey Him? He never tells us that we're outside of His love. Matter of fact, he makes it plain. What can separate us from the love of God? And let me tell you how, you know what? That means that we're giving our children unconditional love. All right? That is different than unconditional praise. I never said give them unconditional praise. Never, your, your children are smart enough to know. After a little while, they'll know what flattery is. And they'll, they'll know that when you say something nice, it means nothing. But when they know that you, genu- they, you genuinely give them recognition for something they've done well, then it will be, it'll be valuable to them because it's adding value to them. But at the same time, unconditional love is saying, you know what? You know, you didn't do well. And I really had higher expectations. And I really believed that you could do better than that. But I just want you to know I love you. Nothing, listen, tell your children stuff like this. Nothing you could ever do could stop me from loving you. Now, I'm not happy with what you did here, but I just want you to know I love you with all my heart. Isn't that how God treats us? I mean, he never, he never withdraws his love from us. Now, do something like this. Never, never label your children as bad children. You're a bad little boy. No, don't say that. No, you didn't do right. You disobeyed. You sinned against God. You broke the rules. But don't say you're a bad little girl. You know why? Because God says that me, listen, when I sin, you know what he calls me? When you sin, you know what he calls you? A saint. You're saved? Yeah. Your sins are under the blood and you still, you, 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 you fall short and you, you do wrong And God still says, I'm a saint. I don't lose my saint status because I disobeyed my God. And God never labels me as bad. I know he sings songs like I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But let me tell you, when I got saved, God moved me from sinner status to saint status. Why? Because I have not my own righteousness, but I have his righteousness. And we should never call that which is good. I mean, put it this way. God says, don't call that which is clean, unclean. And when God's cleaned somebody up, listen. Now, I'm saying as a parent... We're not talking about salvation here. We're just talking about your love relationship. Don't label them as bad. Here's what you do. Let consequences be the bad guy. You see what you've got here? Instead of you having to show, uh, instead of you having to label them and to withdraw your love from them, let consequences be the bad guy. You didn't clean up your room. I just want you to know I love you. I'm not angry with you. But no, you can't go out and play. It's not like, I told you for the last time, you're not going to. No, we don't have to yell at them. Love them. But let consequences be the bad guy. No, you're not going to get the ice cream. No, you're not going to watch the TV. No, you're not going to play the video games. Why? Because you didn't earn that because you didn't do your chore. You didn't do what was right. Now, when you obey, you'll have these things. But let consequences be the bad. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that what happens in our life? I mean, look, you know, um, if if you don't do what you're supposed to do, probably nobody's going to scream and holler at you in many cases, but you're going to have problems from it. Consequences is what holds us accountable. That's the law of sowing and reaping. Don't you see that? Uh, and I got to move on, but I could teach you so much about that tonight. That's the that's where. Listen, Calvinists have such a problem with the sovereignty of God because they don't understand the law of God. 
The way God retains his sovereignty is not by making every choice for you and me. We, a Calvinist says, well, God, we can't have a free will because then we would be overruling the will of God. No, God never tells me every decision I make. He just says this, you make what decision you want, but I will determine the consequences. And that's how he retains his sovereignty. You can do whatever you want to do. But you will never determine the consequences of what you do. God always determines that because he's sovereign. And if you want to exhibit the sovereignty of God in your parenting, you don't have to force your child to do everything you want them to do. You let consequences govern in their life. And that's where the law becomes the schoolmaster. Amen. Amen. All right. Number four, develop a real sense of family. Every child should be loved and included in the family. If you're going to develop self-worth, you've got to say to every child in your family, you are loved and you are wanted and you're included in this family. That means that you, you do two things here. You never compare one child with another. When you do that, you're saying you're not worth as much as that child. And by the way, the other child figures out next week it's going to be you comparing me to them and I'm not as worth. And that basically they all, you, you undermine the, the self-worth of each child by comparing them and you hurt that sense of family. You know, God doesn't hold me accountable. I'm not judged on what I do versus what you do. I'm only judged based on what opportunities God gives me. I'm not going to be compared to the church down the road and say, well, you know what? We have more attendance. I'm a better pastor than that pastor down the road. Or the church up the road that says, well, you don't have nearly as many as them, so you're not as good as pastor. I'm only judged among the opportunities that God gives me as a pastor. And I, God doesn't compare me with, his, with, with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's just me and God. Don't compare your children and don't discriminate. And I'm telling you, you would think this would be the most natural thing in the world, but it's not. I've seen parents... You need to get your, get your hearts right with God if you have a favorite child. Amen. You need to get your hearts right with God if you have a favorite child. Your chi every child needs you. You know what causes? I'm going to tell you what it causes. Right now, we're still struggling with the problems of Jacob and Esau. Yes. You know why? Because daddy had a favorite and mama had a favorite and it's wreaked havoc on this world because mom and daddy, neither one of them was right with God. And they shouldn't have played favorites with either one of those children. Amen. And how much damage is done when mom and daddy plays favorites and they have one child that can do nothing wrong and another child can do nothing right. And I've seen it way too often. Don't ever let that become the way you parent. Create this real sense of family where every child is loved and included. And number five, and to be done, believe in your child. If you're going to give your child opportunity to obey, then empower your child to obey. I caught myself years ago when we, children were young and I was disciplining one of the boys and um, I made this statement and I, I heard myself having said it multiple times in the past few weeks and it's like the Holy Spirit of God just slapped me upside the head and said, you're, you're an idiot. And I had to agree with him. I looked at one of the boys and I said, why can't you obey? Why do you always do wrong? And then I, I, you know, I just realized it. You're telling them he can't obey. And I, it's like, I was like, wow, I am programming my child to believe he can't excel. And so I changed the way I tried to say that and say, you know what? You could obey if you'd set your heart to it. You could do right if you chose to. I don't want to say, you, why, you, why can't you do right? Why, why do you always do wrong? Why do you always disobey me? Why do you always? You know, don't program your children to fail. Program your children to excel. And here's how you do that. Daddy becomes the coach, and I'm using um, metaphors here. Mama becomes the cheerleader. And that means, what does the coach do? The coach tries to get the player to reach his potential, and the cheerleader cheers on all the good things. I, I mean it to a certain extent. Daddy, don't make Mama be the coach. The coach is one, he corrected me when I did wrong. I never had the, the cheerleader come over there and say, Hey, Blackstock. You, you missed the gap right there, and you didn't get but about two yards. If you'd have got the right spot, you'd have got 10 off that thing. No, the cheerleader's over there says, good, way to go, way to go. And I always loved it when the cheerleaders cheered for me. You know? Uh, but the coach is the one that catched me later in the film and said, Blackstock, you know what? You missed the gap right there. <laughs> you know, if you'd have hit that hole right, you'd have got 10 yards instead of two. Okay? 
But you know what the coach did? He didn't take me out of the game. He said, all right, now next week, Blackstock, I want you to hit the gap right. I want you, you know, when they hand that ball me as a fullback, I want, you to, I want you to hit that hole, and I want you to hit it full blast. Blackstock, if you'd, if you'd have done right in linebacker, you'd made that tackle instead of letting him get tackled 10 yards down the field. And he corrected me, but didn't pull me out of the game. He was coaching me, and, and, and you know what? My best coaches believed in me. They, they created a sense in me that I could excel. I could do it. The worst coaches I had kept reminding me that, you don't, you're not fast enough. You're not, you don't throw hard enough. You're not this and you're not that. And they were my worst coaches. My best coaches produced in me this, this, this belief that I could do it. And every dad ought to be a coach. And every mama ought to be a cheerleader. Don't make mama, dad, don't make mama have to do all the correcting. Mama's not, listen, she can do that. And I'm not saying that mama should, you don't have to wait till daddy gets home to, to discipline. But I'm just saying that let mama be a cheerleader most of the time. Let mama uh, be rooting. Now, mama should never cheer for you in spite of what dad says. And dad shouldn't try to correct mama. Now, I say, we should be in a, in a team spirit together. What I'm saying is believe in your child and give them the potential to excel and give them opportunities. You, you may, uh, you may, Gauge how far you think they can go. Give them a book they can read and then help them stick to it till they read it through and brag on the fact that they finished the book. And then when they want to tell you something about it, just cheer them on. When they get a science project, yeah, you can help them, but put them to the task and let them accomplish most of it and, and, uh, and coach them along and cheer them along and be in their corner so that they can Believe in themselves. If you tell your child consistently that they can't obey and that they're bad and that they're disobedient and they're all, you, 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 you paint them a negative picture and they're going to look in the mirror and that's all they're going to see is that negative picture. You paint them a positive picture that they can and, and, and you look for ways to praise their behavior when they do well and you give them opportunities to excel and achieve, I'm telling you, you're producing in your child a sense of self-worth. And it, oh, I could, we could go on all night about this. I wish, you could, I wish I could just share it all with you. You say, well, what about a negative? Or a child does something bad, okay? Every child is going to mess up. Every child, I'm not, maybe not every child, but most child are going to wind up picking up a piece of gum that wasn't theirs. Or taking something that wasn't theirs. Or they're going to wind up breaking a rule here or doing something wrong. All right. That's a negative. That's a bad. Okay, you can't praise them. You can't say you're such a good boy. You didn't steal five pieces. You only stole one. I'm proud of you. No. But what you can do is march their little hineys back in the store and say, I stole the gum and make them confess to it and apologize and give the gum back and ask them, is there anything I need to do to correct the sin that I've done? And when they've done right, then you say, when you get out of the store, you know what? You did wrong by taking the gum, but I like the way you owned up to it. You know what they're going to do next time? They won't take the gum, but also when they sin, they're going to find out, I get praised when I, when I right my wrongs. I get praised. Oh, no, no, I don't want to take them back in there because they'll think I'm a bad parent. Well, you are a bad parent if you don't take them back and make them own up to what they've done wrong. Okay? But you know what? <laughs> we're all bad parents sometimes. So what we do is correct what we're doing wrong so that our children can correct what they're doing wrong. And we get right with God and we say, look, it's not about me. It's about my child. And I want to train them to have self-worth. And the only way they'll have self-worth is if they learn to do right. Amen. You know why? Because they become a vessel unto honor, a vessel that's valuable to the kingdom of God. And that's what we want. Not everybody's going to be a preacher or a missionary, but everybody needs to have a place of service in the kingdom of God. We need to be valuable to God because when we are, what you do for God, you know. Listen, what you do most of your life is going to burn up, fizzle up, go away. Most of what you made this past week will be spent before the week's out. But what you do for God lasts forever. And what we need is to train up people that have a, a real worth. Now, I'm not saying our, work, our work's not important because it does create a value that pays for the, the house we live in, the lights we use, the food we eat, the water we drink. has a real sense of value to it. But ultimately, that we might become vessels unto honor, that we have created a self-worth in the child because we've trained him, we've trained her to do right in the eyes of God. And God can look down on that child and say, you're somebody that I can use in my kingdom. You're a vessel unto honor. And that's what we need to learn about training 
self-worth. 